If you know how to use Command F or Control F or Edit Find, you read documents differently. Now, how do you learn how to do that? I know mean, now some people like the kind of people who read manuals when they buy a new computer. Yeah. Like they'll go through all the menus and they'll examine every menu selection right. and they'll say, "What does this button yeah. do? What does that button do?" And they'll just learn by doing mm -hmm. it. But I gather, not everybody does that. They don't want to make anything complicated. They just yeah. want to know a minimal amount. There, well, you're, you know, you're right. There are some people who read the manual and there are some people who explore every single button. Most people don't. They're not like you and I. They're actually worried. You know, there's a button here. I'm not sure what that label means. Maybe I'm not going to click on it. Maybe it'll break something. Maybe it'll break something. Exactly. You can't believe the number of times I've heard that when I've interviewed people. Uh, I don't know what it does. I'm not going to touch it. Maybe it will bring people back from the dead. So I'm not going to do that. Now, something else that's useful is uh, what's called tool tips. Not everybody knows what tool yeah. tips are. Maybe you could say right. something about that. So tool tip is a way of taking your mouse, moving it over an item on the screen in the user interface, and it usually will pop up a little pop-up piece of text saying, this button does that. So that's a way of exploring. And that's what I try to get across to a lot of people is this idea that you can explore the interface. You can explore how Google works, explore how all these internet applications operate. Because if you're not exploring, you're stagnant. If you're stagnant, everything's moving past beyond you. And I think it's important to realize that the creator is trying to make it easy for you. Right. He's trying to give you features that enable you to do easy searches. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you have to think like the guy who designed it and say, how do I want this to work? What would be easy? That's probably the way it actually works. That's right. Although there's an interesting challenge for software designers because software designers tend to hang out with other software designers and so they tend to think that that's the way everybody will work, works and everybody thinks. Truth is, you know, that's not the way my mom thinks. That's not the way my cousin thinks. And so we have a challenge in the software industry to take the incredible plastic nature of software and make it into something that everybody understands. I encourage people to be exploratory and check that stuff out and try different things. And it's kind of a mindset. Now this gets into the whole concept of learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people start in school around age five, maybe a little younger these days, and they're given material and they're expected to learn it. But do right. we need to teach people how to learn? Is learning itself a skill that you have to mm -hmm. acquire before you even start gathering well, information? Well, I would say yes, actually. Um, you know, one of the tendencies we have is that learning is innate. And it, to a certain extent, it is. But there are styles of learning that are more productive than others. So there's in, in sort of the neuropsychology of this, there's a whole area called metacognition. And metacognition is when you're thinking about your thinking. So what that means is that you might, for example, I could show you a way of reading where you're constantly asking questions and you're thinking about the process of reading and asking critical questions. If you're skilled in that, then you're a better reader, a better thinker, and more able to use the resources on the web. Now, what about pattern recognition? Because that's mm. a large part of what's right. considered intelligence, recognizing the way in which two things are like each other right. or unlike each other. Is that something that you can teach people how to do? That's a little harder. Uh, pattern recognition, as we normally think about it, is kind of an inherent property of brains, an inherent property of minds. And we have, for example, very strong pattern detectors that detect faces, that detect particular kinds of sounds, particular kinds of uh, interactions between objects. So if something bumps something else, I see a causal connection. That's a kind of pattern recognition. But on the internet, all the patterns are new. And so you have to, there's there nothing hardwired for that. So you have to learn how to recognize patterns. So for example, when you see a long body of text like this, you recognize, oh, that's the pattern. I can use the control F trick. Now, what can you say about the way Google organizes its own information? Mm. Because if you enter a search query, it will find a lot of things that are very similar to that. Right. So it must have some organizational theme. And it doesn't just have to be text that you enter. That's right. You could enter sounds. You could enter right. pictures. In fact, mm -hmm. I think you might have some examples of that. I do. I do. Actually, um, let me show you an example of that, if okay. that's all right. Um, let's go back here to my uh, Google homepage. And... One of the things you can do that a lot of people don't recognize is there's a pattern here of being able to search for an image. So for example, I've got here in the upper right corner, I'll open it up. Um, this is a picture of something I took and I had no idea what it is. So the question is, 
how would I use Google to find this? So the simplest way to do this is actually, let me get rid of it there, I'm going to search for images. So I'm now clicked on Google Image Search. And most people don't know this trick, but I can search by image by taking that icon, that image, and dragging it here, dropping it into that box. It uploads it to Google Image Search, and it compares it against the vast library of images that we've scanned. And you can see here, it's found another image just like it, and it tells me it's the foam pale wrench. So you see up here, that query at the top? Foam pale wrench is the best query to bring up that image. Now, foam pale wrench is, it turns out, what that thing is. And I never would have figured that one out. And I have no idea what a foam pail wrench is anyway. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. It's actually, um, when firefighters go and generate foam to put out fires, mm -hmm. it comes in pails. It comes with a lid. You need this to take the lid off. I did not know that. See? But it took me, what did you say, yeah. two, three seconds max to figure that out? Now, there must be billions and billions of pictures on Google. Yeah. Does it compare it with each one to say, this isn't a match, this isn't a match, oh, this one's a match? Effectively, that's what it's doing. What it's actually doing is algorithmically a little bit more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. What we do is when we scan those images, when we're crawling the web, we pre-compute a pattern, and we do a very fast, rapid pattern match. That's how we do it so quickly. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other capabilities of Google that people might not be aware of that they could use if they knew about it? Well, there's a lot. Um, so for example, let's do another query here. I'm going to just go back to the home page, and let's do another image search just for fun. One of the features that a lot of people don't know about is the ability to look at uh, images by color. So let me look for Rosa Parks' book. And um, what I'm looking for here by doing these image searches is I'm looking for book covers. Now, let me scroll down a little bit. And you see this set of pictures, this little uh, right. set of icons down here? I'm going to click on the red one there. And now I'm filtering by color. That is, all these pictures here in particular for the books, are books that have a predominant red color. Really handy when you're trying to find pictures that match a particular theme. So did you know you could search for book covers by color? Uh, actually, I did not know that. Right. And it looks like you can also search by size. You can sort them by large pictures or small right. pictures. Exactly. Or by time. I can filter out. I can look for things just in the past 24 hours or the past week or two years ago. Since they've been uploaded, you mean? Yes, so this would then filter on the time that we scanned it. It could have been uploaded, say, a year ago, but if the Google, Google Spider actually discovered it last week, then it would be written down as being updated last week. Now, you can also search according to sounds, right? And if your browser is equipped for it, you can speak what you're searching for. That's and it'll right. interpret that and convert yes. it into a text query. That's right. It, what we've got is the ability to... Uh, for example, look at, uh, or rather listen to different kinds of, of things. And it's just like speech recognition on your phone, right? So I could say, for example, uh, Pacific Northwest tree octopus. Which there's no such thing, obviously. Well, that's an interesting point, right? We were talking about pattern recognition a second ago. Mm -hmm. One of the patterns people need to understand is this genre on the web of spoof sites, OK? This is a spoof site. And if you don't know that, if you don't know there are parodies and spoofs like that on the web, you might very well be in the seventh grade and turn this in. As your term paper. Exactly, right? Or you might very well do a search for Vikings and talk about the football team, right? Rather than the barbarians coming from the north, part of my ethnic heritage. But you get the point. If you don't know those patterns exist and you don't think about these things critically and don't have the kind of metacognitive skill, who knows what you're going to come up with? Can you do things like hum a few bars of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and have this uh, identify it. You know, that's still a, a... come up with the orchestral version. Yeah, that's still an active research topic. Um, there are exploratory systems people have built to recognize certain kinds of music. And there are tools out there right now you can buy for your phone that will allow you to listen to pre-recorded or copyrighted music. And we do the same trick as we do with the pictures. We take a few samples of the sound, encode that, and then do a signature comparison to find the matches. But it only works with, right now, with copyrighted sound that's already in the library. Humming it is still, it's still in the realm of difficult research problems.